Welcome to Untangling the World Knot of Consciousness, wrestling with the hard problems of mind and meaning in the modern scientific age. My name is John Verveke. I'm a cognitive psychologist and a cognitive scientist at the University of Toronto in Canada. Throughout the entire series, I will be joined in dialogue by my good friend and colleague, Greg Enriquez from James Madison University in the United States. Throughout, we are gonna wrestle with the hard problems of how we can give an account of a phenomenal like consciousness within the scientific worldview, how we can wrestle with that problem in conjunction with the problem that Greg calls the problem of psychology that is pervasive throughout psychology, which is that psychology has no unified descriptive metaphysics by which it talks about mind and or behavior. Throughout this, we will be talking about some of the most important philosophical, cognitive scientific, and neuroscientific accounts of consciousness. So I hope you'll join us throughout. Uh, last time, uh, Greg did this excellent thing where he took sort of the philosophical problems given to us, uh, most prominently by Descartes, but a cohort of other people, Galileo, et cetera, and then he showed how that just sort of unfolded through what he has aptly named uh, the problem of psychology. And so what we have, what we're seeing is that the problem of consciousness is enmeshed with the problem of, uh, of our commitment to the scientific worldview, and I, neither Greg nor I are anti-scientific. That's not the point of what I just said. What we're trying to show is that Descartes' uh, creation of what's been called the mind-body problem, uh, and that's what all the arguments have shown, was deeply enmeshed uh, with the creation of the scientific worldview. And so that's one problematic on one side, and then Greg, and these are not independent, but following up from that, uh, Greg showed an important specification of that problematic in the problem of psychology, which is the discipline that is supposed to be, at least officially, studying the mind, um, can't get its shit together um, in the sense of giving us a coherent picture that we could then bring into how, uh, you know, the formulation of the problem, what's the relationship between uh, mind and matter. And then Greg and I both acknowledge that that's now been exacerbated by the uh, by the emergence of, you know, additional um, competing sciences of mind like neuroscience and artificial intelligence uh, and linguistics, etc. And so we have a very <laughs> problematic situation, Greg, I think. Uh, very difficult. Amen. Amen. And, and I'll just say that um, when we understand the emergence of what happened, as you articulated, with the modern science revolution, it was to the, create this split between, okay, you have secondary representation. Oh, there's a primary qual quantity quality out here, uh, yeah. right? And then we have an epistemological change in empiricism, really, where it's like, oh, it's empiricism is what you see. And it's like, wait a minute, we have to factor out what you see and measure it from a third person perspective, okay? Right. Uh, and then if it's a third person perspective, but what we're also interested in is also a first person perspective. Exactly. Well, that's a real, that's an epistemological problem. Right. Uh, and I just happened to see a, a uh, uh, you know, I scan actually all intro psych texts that come across my feed. I have a feed. So, yes. And I just saw psychology for students, you know, student friendly version. And it just opens up. It says, oh, what is mind? Uh, mind is all these things that are really cool. And then it just says, well, you can't see it. So we saw psychologists to study it, study scientifically behavior. Right. Okay? right. So it's like it does this whole thing, here's mind, and then all of a sudden you don't know what it is, and then they say, because it's science, it has to be behavior, which is basically then saying, because we're in the epistemological category of a third person view, then, then we have to frame it this way. Um, right. and, and then they're often running as, well, actually, you'd really wanna stop there and make sure your problem formation is really clear, make sure you don't start equivocating on what mind is and what behavior is and what you can see and what you can't. They didn't do any of that, they just proceeded. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. that's to me the shit show. Um, <laughs> that is that is the problem, and that's why we're here doing this thing to untangle the world knot. So, exactly. So, thank you. That was good. <laughs> I like it when you when you get in that riff mode. I really like it. Um, so I want to return back, Greg, to Descartes because we've largely had what you might call a negative, uh, you know, what the, the problematic, the critical mm -hmm. aspect, and I think we've done a lot to really. Uh, at least make it plausible that there is a really difficult issue of even formulating the problem in the first place, let alone, which is why I tend to be skeptical of people who just sort of, here's what consciousness is, um, and they do some video on it or promote some argument. 
Uh, not that they should be ignored, I'm not promoting censorship, but I think that, you know, unless this, these, this interset, inter, interpenetrating set of problems is, uh, is addressed, explicit, is explicated and formulated, uh, I think the chances of, of uh, making progress on the on tangling the world knot are, are very diminished. Uh, 100%. I mean, we have historical problem formulation. The other thing I've become very keen on is what's the epistemological dynamic? Yeah. What's yeah. the ontological reference? Yes. And are you yeah. being clear? And if I hear somebody saying, oh, I saw the problem of consciousness, it's this thing. And there's like, and they don't talk ontology, epistemology, or historical grammar of whatever justification system you're coming from, then it's going to be almost certainly equivocating and confusing. Yeah. Uh, and that's where your metaphor, which you've drawn from Wittgenstein, of all of these uh, language games that are not using the same sort of cultural cognitive grammar, using different epistemological frames, having different ontological commitments, um, it, it is making this uh, very, very difficult indeed. And so, yeah, you get, and, and, and uh, I, I, as you know, I've got a video out there about, you know, how even the various competing, competing disciplines, all you know, neuroscience studies the brain, and it uses this method and gathers this kind of data, and then psychology, as you just said, doesn't know. It claims to be studying behavior. It uses experimental method, but blah blah blah. And then you got computer science that no, we what we we don't we don't study brain and we don't study right. We don't study behavior. We make machines that do information processing. All the methods are different. All the all the theoretical ontologies are different. The language games are fundamentally different. And so when people and they all use the word mind and cognition interchangeably, but they're talking about different things. That's uh, right. So. We have to be very cognizant of that. So let's go very carefully. So I want to go back to Descartes and try and pick up on something positive from Descartes. Amen. I want to, I want to remind everybody of our first uh, session, Greg and I had, where we talked about how there's these two fundamental problems concerning consciousness. And there's another place, by the way, there's even sort of equivocation or um, um, negligence in the fact that often these questions are brought up independently of each other, sometimes confused with each other. And this is the, this is the nature of the generation problem. Um, mm -hmm. This is, broadly speaking, how does something like the phenomena of mind emerge or come to be, if, I, you know, I'll, if I'll use a less contentious word, come to be <laughs> in um, the world as it's described by the scientific worldview. And as I'll remind you one more time, this problem commits you to the scientific worldview if you really want to solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's how it's enmeshed. That doesn't mean you have to leave the scientific worldview unchallenged, but you can't ignore it or dismiss it. Amen. So that's the nature or generation problem. And then there is the other problem, which is the function problem. What is it that consciousness does? And that's a more pressing problem than faced by Descartes, because, you know, post Freud onward, and, you know, and then Chomsky and others, we have come to understand how much of our intelligent behavior is carried out by unconscious processes. Yep. And therefore, what is the special function that consciousness is bringing to our intelligent behavior, if any at all? And of course, you know, and I know, there are some people who propose that consciousness has no important function. It's almost a purely epiphenomenal entity. Now, Descartes does something very interesting, and I think it's instructive to us. Um, he, he doesn't solve these problems. But what he does is the way he formulates them might be helpful. He mm. formulates them in a way in which he tries to address the function and the nature problems together. Um, mm -hmm. And I would argue that that is actually a very, very good strategy to pursue. Mm -hmm. So what did, I want to do with you, Greg, is did, take a look at Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was just, did, uh, you are so much more familiar with Descartes than I am in terms of the depth of his thought and how, did he use this distinction? Was he pretty clear on the function nature no. distinction or you're just saying that his intuition and his model basically blend yeah, them, but he wasn't the, necessarily the latter very much okay. the latter okay just um, want to be clear about that and, and in fact i think the integration was so intuitively apparent to him that the distinction is one that i'm anachronistically imposing on him perfect okay just want to be clear about that Thanks. no of course excellent question so let's start with the problematic a problem that descartes uh faced and um and and, and unfold a bit of the problematic around it so for reasons which we've already sort of indicated, uh, and I know you're doing work on it, so I'll give you a bit of space to dive on it, uh, but um, Descartes had come to the conclusion that only human beings had consciousness. Uh, he made that argument because of their capacity for speech. Interestingly, notice he's, cap he's capturing an intuition that we need addressed, 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is the intuition that we attribute consciousness on the basis of the complexity and flexibility of creatures' cognitive mm -hmm. behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually think that intelligence is some kind of important marker of consciousness, mm -hmm. even though we now know that a lot of intelligence is unconscious. So that's why right. this is problematic. But that intuition is nevertheless the one we draw upon when we make our attributions, even today. So if you ask people, do you think a cat has consciousness? Yeah, yeah, I think a cat has consciousness. What about a worm? Ah. Ah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you're panpsychist, and we'll come back to panpsychism yep. later. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so now what that means is, notice what that intuition relies on. That intuition relies on the, that the nature of consciousness and the function of consciousness are actually intimately related. Right. Because I can only attribute consciousness to other things in terms of how they're functioning, very broadly construed. Uh -huh. um, and so that is, of course, I think, a very important intuition. And I'm going to argue that it, it should, unless we can get an independent argument for rejecting that intuition, and given that that is the widespread method by which everybody does the attribution of consciousness, I think that intuition should be taken seriously. Absolutely. And that is one argument among many why the nature and the function problem should be addressed together. Yes. Okay, so Descartes goes in with this problem. He says only co human beings have consciousness, and because he's now redefined the soul as consciousness and all the problematic reasons we, we talked about that, mm -hmm. um, the, the Catholic Church sort of likes that because there's been a longstanding Christian doctrine, which I think might be undergoing revision right now, um, that only human beings have souls. Animals don't have mm -hmm. souls. They, they don't have an afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the, their, Descartes inherits a problem that faced the Christians. Mm -hmm. And you can see this uh, in their, some of their battles with some of the pagan philosophers. Well, given that animals don't have souls, maybe for, in the Aristotelian framework, they do. They just have Absolutely. an animal soul. They don't have... Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Even plants have a vegetative soul. Exactly, right? exactly. Okay. The soul is something much more functional. Mm -hmm. But let's say given that, so Descartes inherits the problem of, yes, but animals clearly are intelligent, like mm. a dog, right? They can learn, they can be trained, they can solve problems, they mm. navigate through the world, they protect themselves, they protect their young, yep. like they seek out and hunt and find food. Like, they, like trying to get a machine to do all of that like it's really, it. really wickedly difficult. We don't have artificial intelligence that's at that level now. Okay, so Descartes has this problem of, okay, if they don't have souls and consciousness, why are they nevertheless capable of so much intelligence? And see how he's confronting the front. See, Greg, it's not, like I said, it's not explicit, but he's bumping into the relationship Clearly. between the nature and the function, right? That's right. right. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, now I'm also in my own frame of psychology, which lines up with your cognitive science. Okay, what we're doing is we're watching the complex functional adaptive behavior of animals, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we're saying there's something that's mediating that dynamic problem solving adjustment system, right? Yes, yes. And, and then uh, that's, a, that's some sort of brain intelligence, cognition, they don't have, okay, don't have cognition as a term, conscious something, right? Yeah. Is, is at least the mentalist assertion. So, so that's that connection, deep connection, just now we have an external view of the world, i.e. a behavioral scientific, and we can just watch what animals do, you know. Um. So uh, maybe before we return to Descartes, maybe this is a good time. I know you just mentioned before we started recording that you're doing, you know, you're doing some review and, and study mm -hmm. of, you know, the attribution of consciousness to animals. And mm -hmm. you said there's a lot of stuff coming out about that right now. So right, we're, right. Uh, the position, if that's true, the that the problem that Descartes is faced is even more pressing for us because we are even much more aware. And it's even harder for us to not attribute consciousness to animals. But right. maybe I've said too much. No, no, absolutely. In fact, now there's a, I think it was 2012, uh, I could find the actual thing. There was a declaration of animal consciousness by um, uh, ethologists and comparative psychologists and neuroscientists that were studying this issue. And that says, absolutely, there's some forms of consciousness in the, in the animal kingdom, 100%, or at least, you know, that's our strong, that's why we need to make sure that everybody knows that scientifically now we believe Descartes is wrong. There's all yeah. sorts of reason to believe that animals have an experience of, there is something that it is like to be a bat, um, yeah. to use the Nagel term. 
Uh, and so I'll just make a couple of interesting points, at least in my own, just for reference. So in terms of deep consciousness, like when does it really get started? Um, there are some people, uh, Jablanka, if I hope I say her name right there, uh, and her colleagues, uh, the evolution of the sensitive soul. Uh, right. she, they go back essentially to the Cambrian explosion. Uh, right. That's about 550 million years ago. And it's really the emergence of operant learning, okay, right. for them. It is, it is that, that is the beginning of uh, experience and pleasure and pain and moving toward and moving away, right. okay? Right. So that's pretty deep and uh, you know, 500 million years ago, 550 million years ago. And then other individuals are looking to see the, the shape or contours or functionality of consciousness. So for example, like how much, what we would call perspectival, perceptual yeah. awareness yeah. does an entity have? Um, some animals seem to have a lot of that. Uh, how much self, uh, almost self-awareness or proto, what I would call proto self-awareness or extension yeah. of intuitive self. Elephants seem to have a huge amount of that kind of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are some people that are then starting to really map different dimensions uh, corresponding to functional responses, brain imagery, then a whole uh, set of assumptions, kind of like global neuronal workspace kinds of assumptions that are operative. So it's, it's really exciting, I think, some of the work that they're doing. Thank you. That is very cool. So let's let's pick up on the first one uh, because I think it's a theme running throughout that the attribution of consciousness seems to be paired with the attribution of intelligence because when you're mm -hmm. getting operant learning and some capacity for learning and problem solving. It's very, so just for people who are clear, so classical learning is like what a little reflex system will do. Yeah. And it could become habituated or sensitized to certain kinds of stimuli. Okay. Operant learning is when you get a feedback loop on your consequences. Yeah, okay. Yeah. When you start doing stuff and then you extract resources, and then you draw your attention and investment in a particular way. That's so much more fluid and dynamic. Yeah. Okay. And also it makes a creature, well, more intelligent. Well, um, there it is. And maybe yeah. more conscious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, within the scientific community, as Greg has pointed out, there's a consensus about the attribution saying consciousness exists. Uh, in terms of its functionality. So again, trying to keep the nature and the function problem uh, distinct, I think is not an intuition, uh, or, or sorry, is not a, a, a strategy we should follow. I think Descartes' intuition um, is, is well-placed. Okay, so back to Descartes, and so let's back to this problem, and which is the problem of, he's facing the problem of, well, let's say like dogs. And then we know he thinks dogs don't have uh, don't have souls because he he justifies doing you know vivisection on them when they're still alive mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, they they don't have consciousness. But he's aware that dogs are highly intelligent. And so how does he explain this intelligence? Well, he brings up something that's very interesting. Um, and this is this goes to the work of my colleague at UFT, uh, Bill Seeger, <clears throat> in his book on consciousness. And so I recommend people to take a look at this uh, because Descartes has often been. Uh, we often are given a caricature of Descartes rather than an in-depth study. And Seeger um, takes uh, Descartes seriously and takes what Descartes does seriously. So Descartes says, and very interesting, he says, well, what animals have, um, and I'll have to use some modern language because it's faster than mm -hmm. trying to, his archaic language and then translate it, blah, 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 blah. So, but basically what Descartes says is, well, what animals have is they have sort of brain states that reliably co-vary with things in the environment, mm. right? They reliably co-vary. Uh, so, you know, if some object comes in front of them, there's a brain state. And whenever that object is there, that brain state, and so they reliably co-vary. And of course, we have a version of this, you know, that's very prominent right now with the whole predictive processing model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well-placed. And also one of, the, one of the sort of standard presuppositions of most models of what a representation is. And you've pointed out that psychologists often don't even talk about what a representation is. They just presuppose it. But in cognitive science, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's this deep question, well, what the heck is a representation? Right. And most models are versions of a covariation model. That mm -hmm. for me to have a representation of the world is for me to have some state in here, often my whole embodied and by, uh, for e-cognition, yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But let's just say some, some state in me that reliably co-varies right. uh, with the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then what Descartes says is, okay, and what that'll do is that'll allow the organism the ability 
to vary its behavior. The covariations, covariations so the mechanism. To vary, yeah, mm -hmm. vary its behavior mm -hmm. according to environmental conditions, mm -hmm. and that will make the organism behave in, a, in, in an intelligent fashion. But what is the organism not capable of doing? It's not capable of reasoning. So what, what's going on there? So here I'm going to help Descartes out by jumping ahead to uh, the current discussion about representation. So when you look, and uh, this is, we can't do another whole series on mental representation. <laughs> so I'm just pointing out the, again how challenging this is. Um, people often, often use this term in a highly equivocal fashion. Okay. But one of the problems that has been brought up by Cummins and others about the covariation theory, and it's a standard, it's now, there's a consensus that it is a genuine problem, is that if I have some object, right, and this covaries, the problem is the covariation covaries with many things, many different possible mental representations. So if I have an apple in front of me, right, this thing is covarying with an apple. It's covarying with a fruit. It's covarying with food. It's covarying with something in my hand. It's covarying with an object that I can throw, right? right. And uh -huh. those mental representations are much more distinct and specific than the covariation. Right. So representation has a referential specificity mm. that covariation does not have. Right. And what that means is it is irredeemably vague in terms of its potential semantic content. So right. while it may be guiding, and then, you know, Quine also made this famous with the Gavagai problem. Mm. And there's all kinds of versions of this. So this is a very, uh, right, pressing issue. And, and this also, I think, is an issue that needs to be taken up. I'm discussing with Mark Miller in predictive processing. It's like, yes, but what is it you're predicting? And what is it that's selecting? Because all of these predictions come through. There's an apple there. There's a fruit there. There's food there. There's an object that I can throw there. There's the thing that the witch used to poison uh, Snow White there, right? All of these predictions are coming true, but they're not all the same plane because right. they have different semantic content. And this is something that Descartes sort of gets. That's why he ties consciousness to right. language, because language gives you the specificity right. of right. reference. And I'll, I'll add just a little quick. So Please. from the unified perspective, I'll just say the constraints then to make that is going to be behavioral investment, which is an energy expenditure function. Like, what does this mean to me? And what does it afford in yes. relation? So there's exactly. going to be a connection between... Uh, that, that this object has affordances, it has stressors, it has an investment relation, okay, and that's going to constrain some of that and frame it in relation. Yes, and I'm going to I'm going to argue, and I think you're in agreement with that, that that's where uh, notions of relevance realization can be importantly brought to bear. Yeah, well, that's a key ingredient that seems to be missing. <laughs> <laughs> so Descartes, Descartes seems, and it's hard, and it's you know, I'm worried of the, I'm worried about the anachronism bias, mm -hmm. but, you know, Seeger is also a very careful leader. What Descartes seems to think is that the job of consciousness is to pick out, to select from the covariation, which aspect is to be made ready for reasoning. Mm. So the job of consciousness is to aspectualize. It's mm -hmm. to pick out the aspect that is going to be made ready for reasoning, for reasoning so that we can evaluate it for the particular truth. So because reasoning cares with truth, uh, cares about truth, right? Mm -hmm. Reasoning needs um, covariations that have been aspectualized and specified so their semantic content is specifiable enough that it can be evaluated. So he has, he has this role for consciousness. Mm -hmm. What consciousness does mm -hmm. is Right when you right the covariations are are something you sort of uh, see through you aspectualize them yes and and that's how you and so consciousness if uh, this is a bit of a slogan but it's a, it's mnemonically helpful consciousness turns covariations into representation through a process of aspectualization that's really powerful and brilliant yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll come back to what Descartes says about it. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, so, please. so let's, uh, 
So again, I'll make another reference, okay? So <clears throat> when I'm looking at this issue, I'm looking at it from the bottom in the evolutionary history of animal consciousness. Yeah, animal yes, animal, yes. Right? And I'm also then looking at it sort of from the top, if you want to use that, uh, the tree of knowledge helps me justify that vertical and yep. angle. And then I want to get into the unique uh, secondary layer of consciousness that is human. Yes, okay? yes. Yeah. Um, and you, when I was listening to this one in the meaning uh, crisis, I think you used this term ready for reasoning a bit, yeah. or at least in the other times. And man, did a light bulb go off, okay? Because yes. the justification yep. systems thing, yes. Yes, right? Right. Yep. says totally. that language and then reason giving means that you now have to give an account, okay? And yep. that means that you do at a self-conscious level, not at a phenomenological perspectival level, but at a self-conscious level, there is the whole problem of ready for reason so you can justify, yes, right? Yes. So, so it's like seeing that Descartes saw that as the problem, you know, and then saw that as a mechanism, it's sort of like he's missing the first part of consciousness, right? But yeah. he's actually really honing into the second part of consciousness, you know, that I can see. And then remember that connects directly to what Freud ends up seeing in terms of, oh, there's an animal consciousness beneath, and this is how the ego is right, a mental right, organ of justification. Right, right. So there are a lot of intersections. And, and I didn't understand Descartes nearly as well as you did. So that made the light bulb go off for me when I first heard it. Now that you say that, uh, that, ma that makes me think of something. Because uh, you know, when we did the reason for reason, we were talking about the inherently social cultural nature of reason. And right. your work on the justification system. And then later work that is convergent with your work by Sperber and Mosque, people like right. that, about how reason is ultimately it's mostly done and mostly should be done in distributed cognition. Dialogue. But, it's, yeah, a, yeah. It's, a, it's a dialogical function that emerges in nature. It's, a, it's not an abstraction function. It's a dialogical function. That emerges. Right. So given that Descartes has the self-enclosed monological model of mind, mm -hmm. right, he can't, right, he can't actually, he can't actually get to the sociocultural yeah. level of cognition. Right, he, right. and he's, he's then dominated by the modern science, which, which gives pristine um, uh, place of analytic reasoning. And then he has to be like, this, is the, this has to be the highest function, analytic yep, reasoning. Yep, and yep. he misses the whole social pragmatic dimension that would have evolved, obviously, uh, prior uh, yes. to these higher order mathematical and, analytics. And is always needed, even when we're doing the higher well, order. Always needed. And that comes later, um, not, you know, and, and obviously really is a psychotechnology invention, essentially, yep. of of cultural evolutionary justification processes. I agree. I, so I just wanted to bring that up because that's another way in which, right, the individualistic, monolithic, self-enclosed- Misses the boat of mod modernist, uh, yeah, neoliberal modernism, not to get into that, but yes, that's, that is one of the corrections is a transformation from hyper-individualism into a much more uh, networked, uh, yes. systemic and social uh, conception. Okay, that's good. So, the, the, but the readiness for reasoning is going to come back when we talk about like global workspace and stuff like right. that. So Descartes has a, and, you know, and also, you know, Block and Ty's notion of poisonness and access consciousness. Mm -hmm. so Descartes, I think there's a, a, a clear precursor there. But, but I want to get up on the, this issue of aspectualization because it's like, what? what you know, and that's, you know, is that really relevant? Um, well, I, I want to now jump into. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very relevant. I want to jump into. Um, you know, somebody who has been a pivotal figure in recent cognitive science, famous, justifiably famous. So this is John Searle, the famous mm -hmm. creator of the Chinese room argument, which is, of course, an important mm -hmm. argument about the nature of mind and right intelligence and, and meaning. But Searle has another argument that people aren't as familiar with from his book, The Rediscovery of Mind, which came out in 1992. Um, and Cyril makes an argument that's very interesting. Now, give me a sec on this, Greg, because okay. as soon as I unfold it, you'll then see how the Descartes stuff we just talked about is relevant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Cyril goes in and does something that you and I mentioned needed to be done. He goes in and says, he says, wait, 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 wait. You're all using this word representation and mental representation. Let's slow down and look at this. Okay. Let's slow down and look at this. And he, he, he draws on something again, and there's already a long heritage coming from Descartes forward on this, at least of it implicit, but often explicit in many people's work, is that, which is the idea, and this is his term, in fact, that representations are inherently aspectual. Mm. What does he mean by that? He means like, you know, that whenever I'm representing something, and you can, you can see how Descartes is it, like lurking behind you. I don't know if you've read this part of Descartes or not, mm -hmm. uh, because Se Seeger's work comes later, I think, in publication mm -hmm. day. But 
this object has just a huge number of properties and there's a huge number of aspects to it mm -hmm. unlimited right. you know all right mm -hmm. and so whenever and, when, I, and whenever oh. that emerges folks just if you're playing that means that we have a combinatorial explosion problem yes exactly okay which right. means now you have a frame problem that you're not going to be able to solve unless you put constraints on it at some level exactly exactly right? thank you greg well said and we'll come back to that again. Right. I just want to make sure. For no, no. I think that's proper seeding for the whole relevance realization stuff, and, and the and the and the and the investment and your investment theory. Okay. So, uh, what uh, what Searle argues is, you know, if I represent this as a phone, or as a rectangle, or as a projectile, or as <laughs> the thing given to me uh, on my birthday, right? Again, we see the similarity to Descartes, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. there's all, th this has an innumerable number of features that co vary with me, right? Um, and so what Searle says is any representation is inherently aspectual because out of all of the properties, I select some subset mm -hmm. and they're not just higgledy piggledy, they're, they're selected as belonging together, mm -hmm. as forming what, you know, you know, the work of Murphy and Medine showed that there's a structural functional organization with any con within any concept we have of the yep. thing, right? We'll mm -hmm. come back to that when we talk about optimal grip and stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. so I select all, out of all the properties, I select some, right, in terms of um, the ones that are relevant. Yep. Then I determine how they're relevant to each other. And then also, and this goes back to, and this is something now emphasized by 4E Cognition, how it's relevant to me. Yes. How it's particularly relevant to me. Brilliant. Brilliant. So uh, oh, go ahead. the, the uh, Gestalt psychologists, uh, okay, this is, you know, which are really precursors, some perceptual cognitive uh, ways of thinking. This is a lot of what they're doing in many ways. They're seeing laws that uh, pull things together. Yeah, okay, exactly. In, in a particular yeah. way that yeah. force a particular kind of, uh, and if you guys, if folks want to, you know, get a real experience of this, go check out like a, uh, uh, a perceptual illusion, like the duck rabbit, depending yeah. on how you look at it. Okay. Yeah. You will see aspects just in your own phenomenology. They'll jump into a duck collection and then yeah. they'll flip over and they'll jump into a rabbit collection. And yeah. you'll see the connection of all the, how the aspects actually, yeah, they don't, they don't randomly co vary. It depends on what you're deciding is relevant or what your frame of investment is and your relation to it. And all of a sudden it jumps into those categories. And Wittgenstein famously talked about the duck rabbit and he also invoked the, the term the dawning of an aspect. Um, and the, the, uh, really, I didn't know about that. Yeah, yep, cool. the dawning of an aspect. Hmm. And you know, and the, okay. and, the, and the Gestalt psychologists had the famous Necker cube, and you've yep. all seen it that three dimensional line drawing, and it flips on whether, how, how it's oriented in three dimensions. So, all of this clearly the case. And then, so Thrills then says, okay, so all representations are inherently aspectual. Notice how he's already giving an independent argument supporting what Descartes is doing. That's mm -hmm. important. But then he does something really interesting. Again, which sounds just like Descartes. He says, ah, but every aspect is dependent on a point of view. Huh. Uh -huh. Ah, right, because right? so if I want to see it as a duck, I have this point of view. But if I want to see it as a rabbit, I have this point of view. Right, if I want to see it as a phone, I have this, you know, we'll talk about it later, I have this perspectival knowing of it. Yep. Whereas if I want to see it as a, a weapon, I have this, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go, okay, that sounds reasonable, point of view, yep, yep. And then he says, aha, now I have you. <laughs> and notice how this sounds like Descartes. And I think it's completely independent, but convergent. He said, but point of view is dependent on having consciousness. Things can only have a point of view if there's a viewer, and the metaphor of sight is being used for to stand for all of conscious mm. awareness. So mm. a point of view centers on a consciousness. And then Searle makes this argument. He says, well, you know what that means? That means that there are no purely unconscious representations. And mm. he seems to have a view that is remarkably similar to Descartes. He seems to think that the brain has something like states that co-vary, mm. and they only become representations when they're actually brought into That's consciousness. Mm. And for similar reasons, that's where they are, in a sense, made ready for reason. Mm -hmm. Because they are now given a determinate content. Mm -hmm. So 
Descartes, well, that's not just the dusty argument. And, and then there was a lot of kerfuffle about this because what, what Cyril then said is, so all this talk about unconscious representations that are in, that can never be brought into consciousness like Chomsky's using, or, you know, or, you know, maybe, you know, even mm -hmm. some of the psychodynamic stuff or any of the learning theorists, all of that's just no good because those are, those can't be representations. Okay. So people got like all upset and everything. <laughs> right, right. All of a sure. sudden you got a language police problem. And what, if you're... <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to say to that is, I think what you've got is an independent and converging argument. And I, we've drawn a lot of people together, Wittgenstein, mm -hmm. the Gestalt, right, right. For the, that the prop, that there is a deep connection between representation and aspectualization mm -hmm. and there's a deep connection between aspectualization and consciousness mm -hmm. this has to be unpacked now Searle and Descartes are making it a very linear right uh, re representation depends on aspectualization which depends on consciousness and that's mm -hmm. the function of consciousness mm -hmm. now what I want to argue is but maybe there's another way of doing another way of getting that uh, the order right right, right. what I want to argue is that maybe there is something deeper that um, is needed for aspectualization. And this is what we've alluded to. And notice how I invoked it when I described how you form a representation. And this is the process of relevance realization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out of the combinatorially explosive amount of information available to you in the object, I zero in on what's relevant. And then how those pieces belong and fit together in a way that's mm -hmm. relevant to me. This complex, relevance realization going on right and so what if we what if we inverted the order and said no no maybe relevance realization can generate representation and the aspectualization and maybe aspectualization then can give rise to consciousness what if we reverse the right. causal error because of course one of the most prominent problems that human beings fall into is the a b confusion of causation right right uh, Right? Mm -hmm. What if there is lots of unconscious processing that's doing relevance realization that then makes aspectualization possible in representation, and then that aspectualization can be a basis for consciousness itself? Then we would get out of all the problems that Descartes and Searle are giving us. Right, right. And that immediately has resonance around a wide variety of different domains. Yes. Right? I mean, and if, and if, uh, so if we, I'll just say one, for example. Please, please. Okay. So when we think about making something, an aspect that becomes salient, um, folks, I'm sure have the experience of everything that you, much of what you do, if you do it over and over again, all of a sudden will drift it at least into pretty far away consciousness. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, sort of get into a procedural way of being that is pretty far away from our conscious. But then all of a sudden you get surprised. Yeah. Okay. And that consciousness all immediately comes back online. All right. Yep, exactly. exactly. So, so if all of a sudden then the aspect of that system needs to be brought together to integrate a whole brain function to start to connect things so that you can then start engaged in mental manipulation and problem solving. That would be- uh, That's beautiful, Greg. And notice how what the experience of insight does for you. The insight, like, you know, Remember when you talked about how the duck rabbit flips? Well, you get that same kind of flip in an insight. You've been mm -hmm. framing it one way and it reframes another way. And notice how that is accompanied and is prototypically even with the icon of the light bulb or the, there's mm -hmm. a flash, there's a, right? right? And there's a, there's a, there's a, and it, somehow there's an accentuation of consciousness in that salience restructuring right. of what right. we find relevant. Your perspective opens up. Yes, right? yes. And see, if we, if we invert the order of explanation by inverting the order of causation, we can start to explain all of these phenomena. But we can also explain how a lot of your unconscious behavior could nevertheless be so sophisticated um, in terms of its intelligence. Amen. So, I want to propose to you that there's now, that means, uh, that brings up two competing vehicles for consciousness, mm. right? One is that consciousness is a function of representational content. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and of course the problem there is, well, we have so many unconscious representations, right? Right. And let's say we, and so what many people do, they reject Searle, 
is what they do is they say, well, consciousness is some kind of representation, is some kind of meta representation. It's representations of representations. Because mm -hmm. right? this, they know in consciousness, the mind somehow touches itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll take a look at that. And there's, there's, I mean, that's a, that's, that's an intelligent proposal, mm -hmm. but it's problematic. Mm -hmm. I want to propose to you, and this is perhaps where I'm being perhaps innovative, uh, that instead of trying to build consciousness out of representational content, we try to build it out of the process of aspectualization right. that is presupposed by representation, right. right? And also presupposed by consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to argue that we could explain that aspectualization in terms of processes that are neither themselves intelligent or consciousness, mm -hmm. neither intelligent nor conscious, namely the process of relevance realization. Right. So, that's right. setting up that argument there. Right, and, and that's, I believe, certainly anything I've seen, I'll, I'll say, uh, talk about a light bulb. When I heard you first lay this out, you know, I was excited all day, okay? Right. So I, I think it's a hell of a, I think it's a hell of an innovation and certainly it, it, it all, I mean, I got, I, I wrote you or whatever, I was, you know, so yeah, it's, a, it's, as we, we're teasing it a little bit here, but it's like, yeah, no, this is a big shift, certainly for me, and I thought quite a fair amount about these issues, so. Well, that's why I'm in dialogue with you. I think you've thought a, a fair amount and you've thought very well. Um, so what I'm pointing to is that aspectualization might give us, or, or, sorry, might be the basis for an integrated response as to what consciousness does. It aspectualizes so that there are representations and it does further aspectualization so that those representations are ready for reason, right? All mm -hmm. that. We're going to come back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we might see that in the shift, as you already indicated, from things being relevant to us to things being salient to us. And we, mm -hmm. we're going to, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right. And then that might also help to explain the nature or the emergence of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if you can get a system that is capable of relevance realization, mm -hmm. then it can start to aspectualize and then it can start to get the basis of what we're going to talk about when we talk about perspective right. knowing. Yep. And so we and might let be me, able to, go ahead. Go ahead let me add that. Uh, uh, so we talked about, uh, you know, making ready for reason. Okay. Yeah. Um, but actually what I'm going to then suggest is really when we're talking about the evolution, it's going to be ready for simulation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then in other words, uh, so a rat can get to a maze and then simulate which side of the T maze yeah. that yeah. they're going to go to. Okay. Yeah. And then they're going to, to run through particular uh, investment paths and make some cost benefit calculation yeah. around that. So this goes towards a, a theory, one of the neuroscientific theories we're gonna invest, uh, uh, the information closure theory that argues that the main function of consciousness is to afford counterfactuality that we can, uh, uh, right? We can, can uh, organisms can work in a hypothetical space, uh, which of course is not the same thing as full blown reason, but it is, again, deeply well, presupposed by all reasoning. It sets the stage for it. <laughs> yeah, very much. Very, well, nice, nice metaphor there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this aspectualization. And I want to move to some work and sort of build up to it a little bit more. I want to move to the work of Zen, <clears throat> Zen and Polition, mm -hmm. um, um, which he's got, I think, the most science fiction sounding name of anybody in cognitive science. <laughs> His last name, by the way, everybody does not have any vowels in it. It's all, it's all, it's all the letter Y, Politian. Right. Um, and so, and, and we have to understand where Politian is coming from. Politian is one of the godfathers with Jerry Fodor of computational functionalism and the computational mm -hmm. theory of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that he's going to make the argument that he makes is, is something that he was led to by mm. the data being generated in his experiments, because it, mm. it, it, it significantly challenges, in some ways, the standard model uh, that he had developed with Fodor yeah. about a computational theory of mind, at least to mm. many people's mind and to my mind. So what Politian was doing was he was actually uh, studying vision, uh, and what you might even call visual attention, mm -hmm. and we're going to mm -hmm. have to get into what a relationship between attention, awareness, and consciousness, <laughs> which is brought. So just give me, for those of you who are already getting your knives out, just wait, mm -hmm. wait, okay, <laughs> give me a chance. <laughs> Uh, but what he was doing is he's doing a, a thing called multiple object tracking. So let's say there's a, a computer screen and there'll be a bunch of shapes on it, like a bunch of X's and zeros, right. and then they're moving around. And let's say the X's are all different colored, like red mm -hmm. and green. Mm -hmm. and what you have to do is 
you have to track them. So let's say there's a green X and it starts here and you have to be able to tell me where it ends. And here's you know, a pink circle here, where does it end? Now you may think, well, I can only do one object at a time. It turns out, no, you can't. You can do more than that. And, and uh, you can, it, there's some question about how big this is between five and eight, let's say, mm. controversy. But right. you can track, that's why it's mm. called multiple object tracking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And you say, well, who cares about this? Well, just hang on a sec, okay? Uh, so what, what Polition uh, noticed is as you max out how many things are tracked, there's a trade-off relationship, mm -hmm. and that's going to trade-off relationships are going to be key to relevance realization. Mm -hmm. There's a trade-off relationship between how many objects you can track and how many properties you can attribute to each object. Mm -hmm. So as I open up the number of objects I'm tracking, and I sort of overload this system with demand, mm -hmm. what happens is that people, well, let me describe it in terms of what happens in the experiment. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's th this thing here on the computer screen and it started as a, as a red circle. Mm -hmm. And while it's moving, it changes into a green X. It changes mm -hmm. its color and its shape. People mm -hmm. don't notice the change in color and shape. Right. All they can, all they can say is whatever started there is now mm -hmm. there. There. Okay. So they don't, they, they lose any um, conceptual properties for the object. All they have is what uh, Polition called fingers of instantiation. And then yes. he created this acronym, Brilliant. instinct. Mm -hmm. And the idea is this, like if I, like he, he thought of like the mind has like, like, well, like almost like mm -hmm. elastic fingers, but mm -hmm. it doesn't know what this is, but it can put its finger on right. it and know where it goes. Know, where it is, where it is, right? Like this, right? right? Let, let me use an example so that, uh, so remember we were just talking about the duck rabbit thing. Right, right. Okay? Right, to maintain attention on it, then all of the aspect realization comes there. But you yep. can then basically zoom out, just have an outline of that thing, okay? Yep. And have some notion about its positionality, but you'll lose your contact with the text, with the richness yep. of it, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So all of the, uh, all of the sort of adjectival content disappears. Mm -hmm. Now what's left is, and if you have to forgive me people, but I'm gonna need to talk this way. And the fact that we don't have ready available terms mm -hmm. has actually been part of the language game problem. Mm -hmm. But what is this doing? Well, it's, it's here now, here now, here now, here now, here now, here now, here now. So this is called indexicality. Indexicals are things that don't have a categorical content to them. Mm -hmm. Let me get, so here's an indexical, this, okay? Mm -hmm. I can use this for anything, this, this, mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. this, right? <laughs> That's different from cat. Cat has a content to it. Yes. Like a set of properties, right. okay? Right. So this is a purely indexical tracking. Mm -hmm. Here now, here now, here now, here now. So. I'm gonna call this, these are adverbial qualias. Mm. They are not adjectival qualias like shape or color mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the kind of thing it is. Right. They are merely adverbial. They are telling you, right, where and when. Here, now, Great. here, now. Great. And all they're doing, mm -hmm. all they're doing is what I call salience tagging. Mm -hmm. When your finger touches this, it's making this here, nowness salient to you. Yep standing out for you that's all it is it's salient tagging there's no adjectival content to it it's purely adverbial it's pure here now now you might say okay who cares ah then volition has this really powerful argument i'm just going to get another object here and another one here i should have done this ahead of time <laughs> no <clears throat> but uh it's it's important yeah okay so Polition requ requests from us that we understand he's going to use a metaphor. He's going to use a metaphor from language, but he does not mean to imply that the process he's describing is a linguistic process. Right. It is a mm -hmm. linguistic metaphor for mm -hmm. a much more primordial process. Yep. Because he, he thinks, I think correctly, and there's evidence for it, that animals have to be able to do even this object tracking right. thing. Okay, so what's the linguistic metaphor? 
I just used it a few minutes ago. The linguistic metaphor is the linguistic metaphor of demonstrative reference. So things have categorical reference, words like cat, dog, yep. right, chicken, right? Mm -hmm. But there are things that only have demonstrative reference. Because they're purely indexical, I can only do the reference in demonstration. Like when I say this. It. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, yes. Mm -hmm. So all I'm doing is here nowness is being salient to you. This. Salience tagging. Yep. Demonstrative reference. Now, Polition says, notice that you need demonstrative reference in order to form your categories. Mm. He says, if I'm going to form a category, I have to mentally draw things together. I have to go this, this, this. Hmm. I have to first I have to have a pre-categorical ability to mm -hmm. draw them, make them salient together mm. in the same here nowness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, Finsting, salience tagging, is actually presupposed by any categorical I identity. Right. So, before I can aspectualize this as a pencil, yep. I have to have first Done, had something that allowed me to draw things together adverbially because there's mm -hmm. no adjectival content because there's no category. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's no whatness to this is. I just have it, this, 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 ah! Now that they're drawn together and salient, they're, right? They're right. together mm -hmm. in the same here-ness, now -ness. Now I can start to see how they belong mm -hmm. together and I can start mm -hmm. to categorize them and find mm. patterns of similarity and draw out particular aspects. Mm. Brilliant. So that means, what Polition argues, what he's uncovering in the multiple object tracking is mm. something that is deeper. He says it's presupposed by all of our conceptual abilities. Okay. And here's, notice what it's doing. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. making things ready for reason by drawing them together through salience tagging yep. so that similarity can be noticed between them. And similarity, we'll argue later, is a, just an inherently irrelevance realization function. Mm -hmm. I see how they belong together, yep. right? And that makes aspectualization possible. Uh, that's brilliant, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the, the, uh, let me, I'll riff off this real, uh, see where, why I had such a positive reaction to this, okay, from my own journey and sort of some sense-making stuff that I was doing. Um, so, you know, I'm really big on concepts of behavior, figuring out what that is. Yeah, okay? of course. At multiple yeah. levels. Uh, like one of the things is what is the relationship between phenomenology and behavior, both epistemologically and their really very fascinating uh, ontological relations across multiple levels, okay? So, for example, our capacity to pull objects, all right, and then track their changes. Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I became, you know, convinced by a whole host of different uh, data, um, but I'll get to the language issue in just a second, that that's, that what is happening um, is that we have perceptual categorical fields for objects in fields, okay, right. yeah. and, and how they change, and then what are their constituent elements that make them up, okay. Um, and so now let's run to make another connection here in the human mind and the formation of language. Okay. Right. Um, so what are the, what are the fundamental elements of, of grammar and language and syntax? Okay. The fundamental categories of is a noun. Yes. All right. Okay. So that's the thing. Okay. A verb, which is how the thing changes. Right. right? Yeah. And then adjectives which are corresponding to differences yep. in, within the yep. noun or, okay. So I was like, yeah, okay. So there's a very clear symbolic tag, noun, verb, adjective, right? Yep. But what I overlooked and what this brought to bear is, well, yeah, and that presupposes the existence of a categorical system that's defining objects, right? Yep. right? And changes that sets the stage for them to be honed in on if need be, but you need to have that frame. Right, okay. right, right. I never really had brought, I was seen through the lens of the frame, but I, your system then immediately caused me to jump out and say, all oh, right, the frame has got to be built. Yes, right? exactly. The frame has got to be built to presuppose all of this. So right. I was like, oh, I, I hadn't really had that 
um, piece of awareness. And then when you do it and it lines up the way, and then you can say, well, wait a minute, the presupposing of that frame, the machinery, the functionality, uh, all, all that, that starts to line up with a lot of cool things. That's well said. Thank you, Greg. And what Polition argument is showing, and what I think I have convergent arguments for, to pick up on this language you're using, is any of the processes within the framing, right, are not going to be processes that are going to, you're going to be able to use to explain how the frame is generated in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because you're just, if all the processes within the framing presuppose the framing, and therefore are not going to be able to explain it. And that's exactly what Polition is saying. He's saying right. all of the conceptual machinery, right, and all of the, mm -hmm. I would argue, the representational machinery mm -hmm. is not going to be able to explain this right. because, right, it is based on a process that is presupposed, mm -hmm. right, this pre-representational, at least in the sense of pre-categorical, pre-conceptual yep. machinery of finsting, of salience tagging. Absolutely. I'm, I'm reminded of the experiments. I'm blanking exactly on, there's a whole cluster of them. I'm sure you are aware, mostly social psych experiments. Uh, like where a guy is talking to somebody they don't know that well. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Change and then something, yeah, the change, change there it is, of course. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Yep, uh, change so, lines, right? Yeah. So, yeah, That's people a, will, yeah, you can do a thing where you're talking to somebody, a bunch of people walk past, it's a stranger, right, with like a, uh, like a, they're just mm -hmm. saying, excuse me, and they pass, like they carry a piece of plywood, and while they're passing, that person is replaced by another person, sometimes different gender even. Right, like, race can change very, yeah. it's and, and people don't like, notice that it's a different person. Right, right. Which, uh, and, and so, whenever you say that, everybody in the, everybody out there right now is saying, oh, I notice. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right, whatever. Like, like right, the gorilla yeah. experiment, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd see it, well, actually. <laughs> now it's amazing, but that just shows how much operation maybe is going on with basic finsting, which we assume is doing aspect realization, but it's actually, oh my God, how much, you know, cognitive work is being done by just organizing where things are and then, you know, filling in the blind spots when we need to, but a lot of it is just running off of, you know, that frame. Thank you. Okay, so let's do a quick cycle back to Descartes yep. and then we'll, cycle. so notice what I'm doing. I'm swinging between mm -hmm. Descartes and current, you know, important cognitive scientists like Searle and Polition, right? And notice we've got both conceptual arguments from Searle and experimental data uh, from Polition, both, you know, you know the, the argument is in a good argument, it should be taken seriously, and the data is robust and reliable, it replicate, it replicates well, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. Okay, so Descartes, let's go back. What does Descartes think's going on? Well, he has, and, and he's struggling, and, and there's vagueness there, but um, again, uh, through the, through, uh, you know, from the help of, uh, of Bill Seeger, by the way, I'm not claiming that Bill Seeger and I, Bill Seeger agrees with everything I say, but I'm <laughs> giving him due credit for his important uh, uh, affording influence on me. So Descartes, people know some of this story. Descartes has the famous idea about the pineal gland, right? And, 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 and you know, and of course that's no solution to the problem. But putting aside that it fails to solve the mind-brain problem, you should notice what Descartes is doing. He seems to think that all of these covariations somehow get superimposed on each other and somehow integrated into consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of how this aspectualization takes place. So he uses the metaphor of, you know, super, superimposition, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that somehow brings an integration. But when I, when I read that, I thought, oh, crap, there's two different people from two different traditions that I think are talking about that. Um, one is Michael Polanyi, uh, okay. coming, coming out of sort of, you know, at the analytic uh, North American scientific tradition. He's originally a scientist, then he becomes a philosopher. Um, and then there's Marlo Ponti, a French person, mm. French person coming out of the phenomenological tradition. Right. So I normally do this with people, uh, but uh, like uh, I actually run through it, but I'll just describe, and, I, and I've done this multiple times, and that's why these examples are used by Polanyi and used by Marlo Ponte and used repeatedly and convert, and they were independent of each other. As far as I can tell, uh, Marlo Ponte doesn't know anything about Polanyi. I don't think Polanyi knows Marlo Ponte at all. But let me just describe, I'm gonna use touch because touch is slower than sight, um, okay. and therefore you can have sort of more introspective awareness of what I'm talking mm. about. So what I do is I'll often, you know, you know, hold out your hand and I'm going to put an object in your hand. I know what this object is, but pretend you don't. And right, or I'll put it on the table in front of you. 
and you're going to close your eyes as if you're a blind person and you're going to tap it with mm. right an object okay. this is going to be your probe and then this is the blind man's cane uh, again used independently by both Polanyi and Marlo Ponti mm. and so and what you're going to do is you're going to tap it and you're tapping it to aspectualize it you're mm. tapping it so that you can right from the tappings you'll be able to and notice this is a weird thing figure out what it is hmm. right and of course you're going to figure it out that's to aspectualize but notice what notice what i'm getting i'm getting a, i'm getting a moment of instinct here now here now here now here now hmm. here now here now is that is that okay yeah salient hmm. tagging but when people do this right they'll often they can often tell me Oh yeah, 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 I get it. It's a phone, it's a phone, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, okay, keep tapping it, but now instead of paying attention to what it is, pay attention to what your pencil is doing, how it's mm -hmm. making those moments of contact. And they go, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And I say, can you now also, instead of paying attention to your pencil, pay attention to how your fingers are moving the pen? Oh yeah. And then I'll say, now see if you can pay attention to the sensations by which you're feeling your fingers. And mm -hmm. some people can and some people can't. Interestingly, this is only anecdotally, I haven't done this experimentally, but mm -hmm. it's very reliable. The people who can, who can become aware of the sensations in their finger are mm -hmm. often people who've had mindfulness training. Hmm. Okay, and then, and, then I say, and then you can go the reverse. You can go from, okay, stop paying attention to your sensations in your fingers, mm -hmm. right? pay attention to your pencil, mm -hmm. right? and then stop paying attention to your pencil, stop, start paying attention again to the phone. Yep. So notice what's happening, right? There's all these layers in there. So I use a metaphor here, uh, and uh, it's uh, a metaphor used by actor, a psychologist, Metzinger, a philosopher. Mm. So again, convergence. Mm -hmm. And so this is the metaphor. It's a transparency opacity shift. Let me use, mm -hmm. give you the analogy and you use the metaphor. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm, and notice, I'm, it, notice how they're also framing Right, mm -hmm. I'm looking through my glasses, yep. which means I'm looking by means of them and beyond them, both yep. by means of them, beyond them. So they are transparent to me. Mm -hmm. I don't see them. I yep. see through them. I'm not aware of them. I'm aware through them, but I can do this. Oh, now I'm not aware. I'm not seeing through my glasses. I'm not looking through them. I'm looking at them. They're opaque to me because I'm looking at them. I'm not looking through them. I can step back and look at. In a similar way, initially, I'm not, if you'll allow me to use looking as a metaphor here, yep. right? Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. looking at my pencil. I'm looking through my through. pencil at the object. That's right. But I can step back and look at mm -hmm. the pencil, mm -hmm. right? Well, now, what am I looking through? I'm looking through my fingers at the pencil. Mm -hmm. And then I can step back and look at my fingers. Really right? And then I can even, some people, they've had the training and the practice, I can step back and look at my sensations and I can go the other way. So each time I step back and look at, I'm doing a transparency opacity shift. And each time when I go the other way, I'm doing an opacity to transparency shift. Yep. And what's happening is things, moments of salience tagging, and that's maybe what sensations maybe primitively mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. are being integrated into an aspect. And then those, and then those aspects are integrated into further aspects, and so on and so forth. And and so Polanyi talked about that attention has a from to structure. Mm -hmm. I'm always attending through what he calls my subsidual awareness into mm -hmm. my focal awareness. I'm attending through my pencil, yep, to the phone. So I, I use this example when I came across it. Okay, and then was like, oh my God, looking through, looking at. You know, I was loving that. All right, I was on on my walk, and I was like, oh my God, I can I can now see this in a lot of things. I was really excited, and then actually it evolved. Okay, so one of my arguments about the evolved into a real useful tool that I think at least other people have now told me, oh, I get what you're saying. Okay, so one of my key points uh, in my critique of psychology science is where enormous ambiguity about the concept of behavior. Right. 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 Okay. Um, and actually, my argument is that one of the huge problems with it is that it has three different meanings, okay? One of which is epistemological, yes. right? Epistemological. You step outside and then you look at the object field change, 
which modern science forced us to make that shift, which we then quantify in relationship to primary entities. Right? Right, right, right. right. Okay. And so now basically that requires then a grammar from an exterior, to use Ken Wilber's term, an exterior epistemology. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And then that frames either everything. That's why like physics, some physicists describe physics as the behavior, as the science of the behavior of the universe at all scales. That's right. what physicists will sometimes say. Okay. So that's a general definition. That's not then if psychology can't be the science of behavior. Yeah. I okay? see point. Yeah. Okay. If if physics is the science of behavior of, at all scales, I mean, if atoms behave, then we then psychology can't be the science of behavior. It right. has to be a science of a behavior of a particular kind. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. And that's what I argue. Actually, the class of behaviors using the tree of knowledge taxonomy should be mental behaviors. Right, okay? right, right, right. Mm -hmm. and both overt that you see directly and covert that you infer in right, relation. Right, right. Okay. So, so then in my book, I'm saying, Hey, scientists, stop looking through the frame of behavior, take the behavior glasses off right. and see that actually the grammar of your justification system is essentially framed by looking through right. the behavioral glasses. Right, and if we right. become aware of that, then we can become aware of the language game that science plays uh, and the grammar that they structured it around. And I structured it around. I mean, I'm a scientist, but we want to be aware of the rules and, and framing uh, that really drive the system. No, that was beautiful, Greg. That's really good. So I want to come back to that actually at some point because notice how your metacognitive ability is making use of the transparency opacity shifted mm -hmm. and how it's presupposed in our ability to make ourselves ready for reason, namely, do some kind of self-correction in right. our problem solving. Well, you gave me one of the many light bulbs you gave me, John, as I listened to your work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Well, you're, you're sharing it back, Fred. Um, so notice what we have here. We have, a, we, have some, we have a process that Helene calls integration. We have to be a little bit careful of that word, though. And he is careful. He's not equivocating. Because there's two senses of integration. There's integration in which you know, you know, here's the parts of a chair and they're integrated together. You can still see all the parts, right? But what he's talking about is more like this. I have, like, I have a left field of vision and a right field of vision. And you can, mm -hmm. you can do this, put your finger and open and close an eye and you can mm -hmm. see your finger move, mm -hmm. right? You, and what your brain does is it, I would say it fuses them like, like, you know, like, a, like atomic fusion. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's that kind of, it's the kind of integration in which the, left and right visual field, you don't see the left and right visual field, you see through them into depth perception. I don't, right, I don't see the moments of tapping, I see through them to do the object. So I am doing some kind of, right, fusion integration of salience tappings, of moments of here nowness, and that is actually a process by which I am aspectualizing them. Hmm. bringing them into a hmm. kind of focal awareness, which is a higher form of salience out of all hmm. the things that initially are like grabbing my attention. This is now given extra attention. And at the same time, I'm aspectualizing something. I'm right. I'm integrating those things in a particular, right. Hmm. Into a particular structural functional organization. So yep. again, Descartes seems to have been intuitively on the right track. There's some sense in which, I have all these covariations, mm -hmm. moments of covariation, and then when they are integrated in this way, and I'm going to argue that that's kind of a, a data compression thing happening in relevance realization mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. but when they're integrated, I get the aspectualization. I'm now ready for reason, both in the sense that I've, be I've begun the process of mm -hmm. giving it categorical content, and also your point, I've now made it metacognitively available for self-correction. Yep. Two of the things presuppose in making something ready for reason. Right. And then you can see that part of what consciousness is doing then is, and maybe I would argue the pivotal thing that consciousness is doing, is this process of recursive relevance realization that is making aspectualization possible for us. Right. And I want to, and, and so for me, then what I want to say is when I hear that, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and the reason that this is another light bulb are all tangled together in this particular kind of light bulb is notice folks what, what we're doing now or what John is doing and then I'm really uh, latching on to is 
we're really building this cognitive functional view of what consciousness is about, this witnessing function of framing yeah. and as spectralizing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. We have not talked about what does almost everybody talk about in consciousness? Oh, redness. How yeah. the heck does yeah. redness happen? Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's certainly where I, you know, go, and it is an important part of this uh, equation, yeah. undoubtedly. But notice we haven't talked about the the features and the experiential qualia. Yeah. We have talked about framing um, and the functionality of framing that sets the stage for aspectualization. Okay, yes. so yeah. that to me is a, that's like, oh, this is a that's what feels so, huh? And then when we see that relation, as it will come back, it's going to be really, really important. So for me, that was a a really cool, oh wow, it's like a coming at this uh, with a very rich view from a different angle than I. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I mean, so yeah, this is very much building consciousness, at least the functionality and maybe some of the phenomenology of consciousness out of the adverbial qualia first. Right. And really getting going as far as we can with them before we turn to the problematic adjectival qualia like redness and blueness. Right, right. So, so it's the thing that's framing object fields, the, the structure of object fields without getting into the quali qualities of those object fields. We have to have a, we have to have a way to bring here-ness and, uh, and now-ness to the object field framing relation. Right, and then there's a third thing. There's the here-ness, mm -hmm. the now-ness, and with the integration, the togetherness. Yes. Right? <laughs> the here-ness, the now-ness, and the togetherness. Mm -hmm. And this goes to what uh, uh, Marlo Ponti called optimal gripping. Um, and this is the idea that you're always, and, and, uh, and, and, and Mason in his book Sentience talked about this in terms of what he called sizing up. So whenever I'm aspectualizing, I'm sizing up in order to get an optimal grip because, right, so like, do, I look, do I look at the object here? Well, I might if I need the details. Mm -hmm. Do I look at the object there? Well, you know, that's pretty good too uh, for the gestalt, but I've lost some of the deep. So typically I'll try and find a place where I get, and they're in a trade-off relationship, right? So I'm going to get the place where I get sort of the optimal balance between the, 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 the features and the gestalt. Mm -hmm. But what counts as an optimal balance is again, well, what's relevant to me and, and the task that I'm undertaking. Mm -hmm. If I want to throw this at you, I'm going to <laughs> optimally grip it in a different way if I want to write with it or if I want to paint it, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So that aspectualization is also simultaneously a process of sizing up. But what that means is I'm, I'm getting trade-offs between what's foregrounded and backgrounded, mm -hmm. what is gestalt and what is feature. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that is relative to what, what, what problems or tasks am I undertaking? And of course, this is part of your whole point about uh, you're making decisions about how am I investing. Right. Right? How am I investing my right. metabolic energy, my precious temporal? All the way, all the way down the bioenergetic scale, yeah. right? Yeah, so exactly. you're, you're a vector uh, moving toward and away things. So, yeah, that frames that. But yes, that's absolutely right. So the promise I'm going to leave people with, because I think we should end it here, is mm -hmm. that all of that stuff we're talking about, right, about the trading off and investing the bioeconomic and, and, and doing all of this, uh, zeroing in on relevance, that's going to be... We're, I'm going to discuss that with Greg explicitly when we move to the topic and the theory of relevance realization. But right. that's where I think we can leave it for today. I think yeah, we've made yeah. some important progress today. Absolutely. And so I'll just uh, just summarize. Okay, so a fundamental shift here, folks. Greg, uh, you're you're really quiet all of a sudden. Uh, um, I'll summarize a fun. Is that better? A little bit better, yeah. Uh, I'll summarize just a fundamental point: the shift between uh, adjectival qualia into adverbial qualia uh, and the framing of what we are doing to bring that here-ness, now-ness, togetherness uh, is, is absolutely a, a fundamental shift, in my opinion, that really opens up so many different uh, novel insights. I agree. Well, a great journey again together right. today, my yeah. friends. So thank you very much. That was really good. And thank you for that summary. And we will pick this up and we'll move forward. And we're gonna, we'll take a look at meta-representational theories of, uh, of consciousness, and then we're gonna move properly into uh, the, you know, neuroscientific theories of consciousness. Great, great, fantastic, all righty. Okay, I'll see you soon, my friend, take good care.